I had some humble beginnings. Uh, worked in, you know, grew up in the United States. Obviously, my uh, father was in nuclear construction. Uh, that means that he worked at the various nuclear plants that were starting up all around the country, uh, mainly in the 1970s. Uh, so we were a, a literal uh, nuclear family, just uh, parents and myself and my brother. And so we, we always uh, lived in the, you know, bit of a middle of nowhere, right? They, they don't build the nuclear plants in the big cities outside of Manhattan. Um, so everything is self-directed. It's like, you know, go manage yourself, go, you know, go out in the yard and dig a hole to China. It wasn't until I learned much later in life that uh, if I actually did try to do that, I'd end up in South America. Uh, so... <laughs> I had an early introduction to technology. Uh, my dad, uh, being in construction but being around nuclear and stuff, he got exposed to a lot. And so we started to see technology show up. We would barter things for it um, and start to play with it. But because of this, we moved around. Um, and growing up in the 80s meant that there was, you know, everything was still very tactile. We often lived in places like this. So out in the countryside, um, little house. Uh, and if you look at this, you think, you know, wow, this is... This is actually quite idyllic. You know, what a really cool place to grow up as a technologist and be creative and build things and invent things and work with technology and put your hands on it and everything. Um, and, and that's very true. Um, but there's something that, you know, you don't immediately realize uh, when you're out in this place and you're growing up in the 80s. There's something missing. All right, so I've always been into tech. Uh, I started programming early on, uh, programmed in BASIC, programmed in HyperCard, programmed in Pascal, did HTML. Uh, early on, I built so many computers. Uh, there was always parts, different electronics just laying around and wanting to play with that and see what you could do. Uh, later on, I operated an electronic bulletin board system um, as a young person. Uh, and so we had people from all around the area. This is when long distance was still a thing, so you had to pay money if you wanted to call something that was outside your area. So the BBSs had formed a bit of a network in, in and of themselves. And so we would connect to each other. We would exchange messages. Uh, and so you always had a mailbox that was waiting for you. You could log into the one that was local like mine. Uh, and you had messages that for, were for you from other BBSs in other states that eventually made their way. Um, that was pretty cool. And I started with the AT&T family when I was 18. Uh, so that's me uh, at 18. Uh, a little bit different now, a little bit... You know, I've expanded a lot, you know, in my life. So coming out of being 18 and getting up here in, in my 40s and talking about, you know, technology, I came back into AT&T uh, in 2022 uh, to operate this organization that we call Enterprise Day of Technology. And there was a few things I really wanted to accomplish, things that from being at AT&T before really mattered to me. Um, those were modernization and being able to build to a common data fabric and build an architecture that could evolve with the needs of the business and even the needs of us as, as engineers, as developers, as data scientists. So as all technical people, you all want to build a space that you enjoy. You want to build a space that's fun to live in. Um, like Santosh says, you want to build a place that you can feel free to get in that zone and just go and out comes the code. That's the sound of the code coming out. <laughs> But uh, all good stuff. And so you say, well, what, what would that mean? Like, what would that mean you had to focus on? Like, how would you get there? Well, you would put together a few teams. You would build your biz ops and tech strategy. That's what Stephanie leads. And you would say that you would want to pull together teams that could make life easier uh, for your technical folks that are around you. So you say, well, what's that measure of success? Well, two things, two variables have to increase at the same time. One is, is that productivity has to increase. If productivity is not increasing, but yet you're working on something, and the question is, well, why are you working on it? Are we wasting our time? Are we just spending money and we're making tools, but we're not actually changing the environment, changing the dynamic, making things faster, better? The other thing is, is that the engineering employee experience has to get better, right? The, the feeling of operating on things has to get better. If the satisfaction as an engineer doesn't go up, but yet you're getting more tools and productivity is getting higher, but your satisfaction is getting lower, what does that mean? It means the tools are taking away the joy of your job instead of taking away the things that aren't joyful. And so what's joyful? Well, joyful is being creative. Jo joyful is being able to implement something that's for the first time and get that sense of innovation. Next is you'd want to build out that enterprise architecture, make sure that you had computational processes that can scale, right, and be unlimited in their scale. And so putting that together and making that a painless experience. You'd want to build out data products. 
Why? Well, if your company has been around 145 years, what's your oldest data set? I can tell you I've worked with some of them. When that uh, young 18-year-old man started with the company at Bell South, uh, his job was to go around to different locations out in the field and go find these metal boxes and open them up and look at what was inside and write it down on paper. And then he would go back to the engineering center and he would find what you've probably seen in your university libraries or your local library system or government offices. You find these filing cabinets. They're about this high. And they go on and on and on and on. And the drawers themselves are five feet wide and they're stacked three high. And so you go find that and you pull it open and you pull out this old notebook covered in dust and you open it. And inside that is carbon paper. And the carbon paper was what represented the engineering plans for how those cables got in the box. And so your, this young man's purpose was to look in that box and say, what's in it? Is the equipment in it suitable for being able to convert to digital access? The equipment in the box might be, but what about the cables in the ground? What about the cables in the air? Digital signals don't work over things that were used conventionally, like load coils, right? So if you make a load coil, it's just an inductive loop, right? Sorry, electrical engineer. <laughs> So you have this process that can amplify a voice signal, but it destroys data signals. So the only way to know if you've got one is to go back to the carbon paper, flip through it, look around. So you find something or you don't find something, that also goes on the paper. So then he'd go back and he'd go up to uh, top of the tower in the uh, state of Florida in Jacksonville over the St. Augustine River. And he'd plot everything he learned uh, out on the GIS or um, graphical, the ge geospatial information system uh, and print that out on big four foot wide pages, uh, take that up to marketing so they'd understand that if we put equipment in this box, then these are the customers we could address with that new equipment and they could upgrade to digital. They could get high speed internet, one and a half megabits at the time. So it was a lot of fun. But it let me know really and truly how much I loved software. That was a joke, you can laugh. All right, so end-to-end -end data products meant let's build software that can teach people about the information so that the process of hunting for information in our current digital age isn't as intensive as it was for that 18-year-old kid in the age prior. Because the truth is, it still is that intensive. The next thing you'd want is you'd want to build out your warehouse You'd want to make that process fast. You don't want to make it efficient. You'd want to be able to build applications that are data powered. And you'd want to be able to supply that data through a robust system to collect it and a robust system to monitor and operate it and make sure it's bug free. The next thing you'd think about is how do you win? So our, our boss, uh, the chief data officer, he says that my favorite thing to do is to win. And if, you're, if you're not first, you're last. And if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Things like that. <laughs> so what are your ways to win? Your ways to win are to modernize, execute, do your culture, increase efficiency. But the way we think of these is we say that CDO has some big rocks, like getting out of legacy technology, getting more information about our data, building out more data products. Those are all good things. But what does it mean to win? Winning means that you've accomplished something that anybody can look back at and say, well, no matter what anything else turned out as, they accomplished this, they won. No one else could have done this. This was important. And so we have our list of important things that we make every year to say, if we can do these things, we win. Okay. So here we are in India. Uh, I have a bit of an attachment to India. Being here is special to me. Um, one of the things I notice is just how connected everybody is, how much family environment there is, how much eagerness and willingness to learn and engage there is. And being here, you know, really um, makes it no surprise that your national anthem starts out with, all Indians are my brothers and sisters. Like, you can see that every day. In fact, <clears throat> when I got my... Uh, OCI card, I was so happy, I was very proud. Um, and even now when I get into the short line in immigration, I'm, I feel very proud to hand my card over and enter your country. 
Uh, and so thank you for hearing me out. I think a lot of you are going to be technology executives today. I hope some of the mode of thinking about how to imagine that role, how to imagine what's important, and how to imagine how you win uh, comes into that job. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.